Hey there, my friends. This is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, and I want to welcome you back to another episode here on the Fit Mother Project podcast. Today, we're joined by guest expert Amy Wilson. She is the nutrition coach pharmacist, and Amy is a board-certified geriatric pharmacist, a certified fitness professional, and a certified nutrition coach who is disrupting the diet industry and helping her clients take back their health. And Amy's mission is to empower her clients, typically fit moms and middle-aged women, to take charge of their health and balance their lives. And she has over 30 years of experience, certainly on the pharmacy side, also seeing what happens when people are aging in good ways and in bad ways. And she's so passionate about getting to the root cause of helping people prevent and reverse diseases through her own personal and professional experiences. And in today's conversation, we're bringing Amy on to talk a lot about what it looks like when our parents as they're getting older and what it looks like and what she sees in nursing homes and how we can offset a lot of this cognitive and cardiometabolic decline that so many of us are at risk of facing, as well as how we can reverse diabetes, how we can improve cholesterol levels, how we can navigate and manage hormonal changes around menopause, and just create a sustainable health plan that actually works. So Amy, welcome to the show. So happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this topic. This is my favorite topic to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> For sure. And I think it's it's very fitting because you walk the walk, you talk the talk. It's nice to go to school and all, um, but you're really like a living embodiment of your work. You're healthy, you're midlife. So on that point, I think it'd be nice before we get into some of the specific topics for people to know a little bit about your background, like where you're at, where you live, what your family's like, and why you're so passionate about this in particular. I live in Louisville, Kentucky. And I have a wonderful husband who supports all my craziness of being a pharmacist and a nutrition coach. Um, and then I have four dogs and three cats. So it's a, it's a kind of a happy furry home, <laughs> lots of fur. <laughs> I have been teaching uh, fitness classes since I was 17 and wow. started, started teaching when I went to college to become a pharmacist. It was one of those things that, hey, um, I don't like this library job and getting paid to work out sounds really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, th- the problem is it was a great job. I still teach to this day. But it's ebbed and flowed. I was an exercise addict, actually diagnosed. I blew my back out when I was 29 from wow. trying to out train a bad diet per se, or, you know, it, it would binge or eat. And then I would use working out on top of my classes to try to stay skinny in, in shape. And it's been through these years of experiencing my health journey, what's going on with me, especially when perimenopause and menopause hit and my A1C, which is a diabetes marker for if you don't know, um, started going up because the type 2 diabetes gene runs in my family. And when things stopped working, I really had to hone in in nutrition. I really had to figure out the working out wasn't working. I, I, I think any female in midlife is saying the same thing. It's like, throw your hands up in the air. is like the things that used to work don't work anymore. And it's just yeah. maddening. And then while I'm going through my fitness, my nutrition, I'm also seeing in my pharmacy practice in the nursing homes that the average age of my residents is getting younger. Yeah. And I'm sure you see it in your practice. It's like, I, I'm getting 40 year olds, 50 year olds, sometimes 30 year olds. And it's all metabolic diseases. It's all diseases that can be prevented. And to realize that we really need to start taking charge of our health, especially we have a, I always say we have this opportunity, but it's a really small window of opportunity to get it together so that we in our second chapter of life can live the best life with energy and purpose and not in a wheelchair or a nursing home or on 30 medications that people come in on the nursing. 30 medications is my average, which is just crazy. I'm a pharmacist who doesn't want you on medication. We can prevent you being on all those medications. And that's where my passion is, is to help people. I do online coaching to help people not only in midlife, but so that they can thrive and be amazing in their second chapter and not be in resident in my nursing home. That's beautiful and powerful. I want to kind of paint the picture of like how bodies break down. Like when someone is in nursing home care, like what are in the, in their symptom of our modern culture Yeah, and 
what's breaking down in the body? Like, what are the systems that are damaged? How is it affecting heart, brain, circulation? Like, what's going on? What's some of the underlying pathophysiology? As simple or as complex as you, as you want to go, I just want people to understand the connection of what actually happens when someone is in that state from like a body perspective. I think simply just say that we have a blood sugar issue. Okay, it's we're not our blood sugar is not stable. We have been inundated with ultra processed foods that has killed our gut microbiome, that has caused us to have these blood sugar spikes. And because we're always trying, our body's trying to chase health, it's trying to, it's trying to do its best job to have homeostasis, to have it where things are working, but we're not giving it the proper tools. So when we're inundating with ultra processed foods, when we're having these blood sugar spikes, now we're looking at diabetes. We're looking at heart condition. We're looking at extremely high cholesterol. And you start putting that stuff together and you don't do anything about it. Your body can't keep up. And then we do get issues with diabetes. We get renal disease. We get wounds that don't heal. That's why people lose their limbs, heart attacks, strokes. And now we even see that sugar is probably related to Alzheimer's and dementia. For sure it is. So there's all these things that we could do preventative wise, but I think a lot of it is maybe it's either I call it analysis paralysis or just not being educated. And those of us in the health profession are like, well, yeah, you should know how to eat, but that's not what we're seeing in the media. That's not what we're seeing on commercials. That's not what we're seeing in most diet programs out there is that it's all structured around a shake or it's all structured around quick fixes, quick foods. And that's not supporting health. That's not preventing, that's not preventing disease. Yeah. It's about developing a lifestyle that is integrated, sustainable, whole foods based. And I definitely want to get into some of your nutrition philosophies on how to manage that, but like get, let's paint the other kind of promising picture. What does it look like for a body and a life to be healthy and thriving at, let's say 80 years old? Like, what does that look like from an overall perspective? Like what could we experience? An 80 year old doesn't look like they're 80. That's, that's, ex- that's it in a nutshell. The people that come in that are 40s, 50s, 60s, they look like what you would think an 80 year old looks like. Their skin is sagging. They have more wrinkles. Their coloring isn't good. Their hair is brittle. And when you are healthy, your skin is amazing. You feel good. You're able to get out of bed without aches and pains. Your body, you're moving and you have muscle tone. I think that's what we don't realize is that, you know, you go to a high school reunion and you look at everybody and you start saying, hmm, wow, do I look that old? Or wow, they look so young. And then you start talking to these people and maybe they're a smoker and that's why they look older. Or maybe they drink every night and you start hearing what they do and their stress. And you're like, okay, this is aging them. Then you talk to somebody who looks young and they're so happy and they're talking about their health and maybe their tennis game and they're active. And there really is a differentiation between how somebody acts who looks young and then how some, yeah. what somebody does who looks older. Yeah, really well said. And I think we've all had that experience of seeing old classmates and like just seeing the progression of lifestyle choices playing out in front of our eyes. Amazing. All right. So nutrition is obviously a huge part of this, especially with your story, having, you know, been so into fitness and exercise and then also understanding the pharmacology, but then coming back and being like, oh, wait, I need to eat better. And you've made the fundamental statement that we need to regulate our blood sugars to be healthy. So what does it look like to you? And maybe this could be a reflection on your own eating routine or stuff you would kind of generally say for your clients. Like what is a way that you teach how to eat as specific as you want to be to have a healthy body and regulate blood sugar and proper nutrient intake? So I teach something called macro tracking, which is macronutrients, which is protein, fats, and carbohydrates. I am very much against calorie tracking. And people are like, oh, but why? Because I've always been told I eat 1,200 calories or 1,000 calories. I said, that's the reason because you're not looking at the quality of food. And then I'll have somebody who comes to me and says, well, I eat clean. And I can't figure out, I eat clean. Why am I not losing weight and losing inches? Well, you're eating clean, but maybe it's all carbohydrates. Maybe it's all protein. And when you macro track, everybody's individual, whether 
your male, your female, your height, your activity level. And you can look at the amount of protein you need, the amount of carbohydrates you need, and the amount of fat that you need. And then you're also looking at the quality ingredients. You're not looking at necessarily the calories because you it may not be 1,200 calories. More than likely, it's going to be more because you absolutely need more nutrition than what you've been taking in. So that is what I'll start working with with my clients. But it's not a here you go and go for it because some people have been doing macro tracking. It's very easy. But if you've never done macro tracking, it's a learning process. I always tell people, it's like you don't go outside and run a marathon today. You don't. You have to train for it. You have to train to be healthy. It's it's a lot of times a new learning. It's a curve, learning curve that you have to take baby steps and be okay with baby steps. I always say we are not in, we live in an Amazon Prime world, but we're not Amazon Prime. We can't get that body in two days. And understanding that when you start working on the health side and stop chasing skinny and that pair of jeans or whatever you want to wear for the new next event that you're going to, when you start looking at the health, I can guarantee, yes, you will get the body that you want and that you crave. It's just going to take a little bit more time, but you're going to get there the right way. And not only will you look good, you will feel good. And I think that's so important. We forget that feeling part. Mm -hmm, For sure. I mean, the feeling is the expression of health. The looking is oftentimes can be an expression of health, but you can, I, I've been, you know, there's many people who look good, but aren't actually healthy yeah. on the inside. Okay. So back to the kind of macros and specifics, are you a believer in like higher protein diets or is there a general protein intake that I know everyone's going to have a slightly different amount of protein, but like, where do you fall on the protein uh, kind of equation and how would you start to help someone figure out that aspect of general grams or percentage of calories for protein targets? Well, more than likely women, we haven't gotten enough protein anyway, but okay. as we get older, we don't absorb as much protein. So we actually do need more protein. I, uh, if, if you're looking at a macro percentage, it's usually 40% carbs, 30% fat, 30% protein for somebody who's in midlife. Yeah. And what that does is that helps one be able to, yes, balance your blood sugar, you're getting enough nutrition. So now you are actually able to preserve and build muscle. And yeah. as we age, one of the biggest problems that we have is losing muscle. For sure. And if we can keep that muscle and actually build that muscle, one, our metabolism is much better and our health is much better. We see that, I would say muscle is, is the fountain of youth. We see people who have good muscle tone. They look younger. They're able to yeah. do more. And that's something that we really need to be focused on especially for females. Females, we've never... Guys always all, guys always are looking at their muscle tone. And I'm Gen X, Gen X baby boomers. It, it, was, it was to be skinny. It wasn't to have muscle. And to understand that muscle is a good thing and you won't be Arnold. You're not going to be Sylvester Stallone. That won't happen. But to have that muscle is your... That's, that's your ticket to aging backwards. Yeah, for sure it is. I think there's a lot more research coming out too on how muscles now like considered a longevity organ and certainly not just for the metabolic benefits, but I guess like even for the fact that it's a spot, it soaks up a lot of the blood sugar and helps yeah. stabilize blood sugar and all that. So that's massive. And the combination of a higher protein intake plus strength training is kind of so foundational for midlife women. I think it's probably the most important for midlife women, especially around menopause too, uh, when estrogen levels are changing substantially and then a risk for a whole bunch of stuff goes up as estrogen goes down, even more important to strength chain. So how, do, you have a, do you have any suggestions or preferences on number of meals per day? Um, do you like intermittent fasting type of stuff? Do you like breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner? Does it depend on the client? Like, How do you think on the meal timing and frequency aspect of it? It's definitely individual. And this is where I think some programs get it wrong when they try to cookie cutter it. When, you know, I think we, all of us who read Cosmo and Glamour and Women's World, and you see this diet and you look at this and going, okay, well, maybe I can do this. Like, oh, well, cabbage, I'm not going to eat that. It's, and it has to be tailored to you. It also has to be tailored to your work schedule. I might have someone who's on third shift. And so I do something, I do intermittent fasting, but here's the caveat is intermittent fasting as a tool, not a diet. 
meaning that you have a set amount of food that you need to eat and you need to eat it during what's called your feeding window, that time when you're when you are supposed to be eating. Not one meal a day, especially for females, is that has been shown okay for sometimes for males, but not for females. Yeah, and the problem sure. a lot of people say with intermittent fasting is that, oh, well, you know, I don't eat these hours, but then when my window's open, I just eat whatever I want. That's not healthy either. And so if you're using intermittent fasting, you want to use it as a tool to where you give yourself digestive rest that will help increase your insulin sensitivity, decrease your insulin resistance. But then you pair that with your macros and what you need. And it's amazing. As I always say, it's magic. It's kind of magic what happens. But intermittent fasting can be 12 hours, 12 hours eating window, 12 hours not eating window. It can be 14, 10. It can be 16, 8. And it just depends on the person. Usually I will start most people out at 12 hours and they're like, well, that's nothing. I'm like, but au contraire, let me walk you through your day. This is what you normally do. You wake up 4.35 o'clock. You may have um, some coffee with your creamer. And then you are grabbing maybe a muffin or a bagel out the door. You get to work, you grab something else. And then it's 10 o'clock and you're grabbing something else. And then it's noon, it's time to go to lunch. But you're like, oh, I already ate all this stuff. So I'm going to gonna I'm gonna skip lunch. We'll yeah. just skip lunch. And then two, three o'clock and you're starving and you go to the Snickers bar or whatever yeah. and binge. And then for dinner, maybe it's like, oh, well, I'm going to have a light dinner because I had that Snickers bar. Yep. And then now it's 9, 10 o'clock and you're starving again. <laughs> and you know, you had that cookie batch that you made or brownies or the ice cream and it sets you up on a binge and, it, and it, it's a trigger. 100%. And, and so what happens, so now it's 11 o'clock at night, you go to bed, you're not getting your eight hours and you only have digestive rest for about five or six hours. That's not enough. And that will cause those sugar spikes. That will cause the imbalance of blood sugar. So when you actually can say, okay, I start eating at this time, I stop at this time, and you have a plan and you're actually getting the food that you want, it's not gonna, you're not gonna wanna binge because you are giving your body the fuel that it needs. So it's not gonna be like, oh, where's the ice cream? Where's the sugar? Because sure. it has all the energy. Yeah. And a beautiful way you're preaching to the choir. I mean, these are yeah. so foundational to the tenets of our fit mother lifestyle. So the ladies listening to this right now are nodding. They're like, yes, <laughs> yeah, we know this. <laughs> I totally love that. I'm curious. Um, I just, cause I think it's fun to pick the specifics with all your experience. What are some of the go-to healthy carbohydrates and go-to healthy fats that you incorporate in your meals that work well for you, or just generally healthy carbs and healthy fats that you think are like awesome foods that more people should consider eating? I, well, I love my fruit. I absolutely love my fruit, but I also have to have a lot of fiber uh, to keep my blood sugar down. So I love broccoli. I love salads. I'm probably somebody who may be weird, but I do. I, I like everything in a salad. People are like, salads are so boring. No, not when you put everything in it. Salads are amazing. So those are my favorite healthy carbs. My favorite healthy fats, avocados and nut butters, hand down. <laughs> those those are my absolute favorite favorite, favorite, favorite. I love nuts. Uh, avocados. What are kind just of nuts amazing. do you eat? Um, I will do almonds and then every once in a while Brazilian nuts. Those are supposed yeah. to help you with the thyroid. Uh, and there's probably not a nut I don't like. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And so you'd salads, are these a lunch occurrence, a dinner occurrence, both like protein salad? Is that a regular meal for you? Both. I usually will start out with a, a salad just to get the fiber going, to slow yeah. down the digestion. Uh, fiber is huge and also for the gut microbiome. So it's either salads or it might be broccoli, yeah. uh, might be might be lima beans or something like that. But there's going to be some kind of vegetable at per se lunch and dinner. Um, avocados, usually, I usually always have avocado toast, um, yeah. with eggs and egg whites. And That's so nice. I will have that. I'll have that every morning. I always like to say, keep it simple. Cause people are like, Oh, well, what, what should I eat? What should I eat? I'm a person of habit yeah. and I'm busy. I'm a full-time pharmacist. I'm a full-time nutrition coach. I don't have time to cook seven yeah. course meals, elaborate meals. Yeah. yeah. And so eating healthy doesn't have to be hard. And we have to take that stigma out that if you're going to eat healthy, it's going to be seven courses or I have to be in the kitchen all day. It doesn't have to be, we can make it extremely easy. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, this is something we talk about in our programs is go to meals and go to food. So like the avocado egg toast scenario could be a beautiful go-to meal. 
like a, we call them perfect plates, but effectively like it'd be like broccoli protein and then a, a small portion of carbohydrate, which is probably for most people around 40, 50 grams for dinner, which is yeah. probably going to fit within the the macro balance that you suggest, which is pretty much the exact one I Same. suggest too. Yeah. It's like nice balance. I love that. Let's talk about inflammation. Are there foods that you believe that you kind of like strongly preach against that, that are like blanket statement, inflammatory, get out of your life. And on the flip side of that, foods that you say that you want people to have that are good for fighting inflammation. I think people have a general sense that inflammation is body responding to things, damaging, smoldering effects that hurt your health. So let's talk about inflammation and the foods and how that plays in. So I, first I want to say, I'm a girl who loves her chocolate chip cookie. So you're not going to take that away from me. And you have to find balance and understand that balance may be just one time a week instead of every night and, and be okay with that. But usually when you're fueling your body with good food, you're not going to have those triggers. You're not going to want those sweets yeah. or, or I would say junk food. Ultra processed foods is probably the biggest culprit when it comes to inflammation. And what I mean by ultra processed food is those that have chemicals, added sugar, added dyes, the pretty packaging in the grocery yeah. stores is things that bright, things that get your attention. Processed foods, meaning like frozen vegetables, that's fine. That's that's great. But when it's made in a lab or it's made with chemists to figure out how we're going to get the specific mouthfeel and get you addicted to this product, that's not good. It's Our body is one huge chemical reaction. Things that we feed it will either get those chemical reactions to go, I would say go boom, because that's what we want, or it will cause us not to have those chemical reactions. And now our body has to figure out how to process, how to get the nutrition and the elements that it needs. And if you're not giving it, it's going to take it from muscle. It's going to take it from bone. So the ultra processed foods is something that we really need to start swapping out. And that includes healthy frozen meals because they're not healthy. Even though they say healthy, they're not. I know they're quick, but they're not doing you or your body any favors. Yeah, I totally align with that for sure. And I mean, this is why getting the skills of how to make convenient, quick, like dinner meals and go-to stuff, whether it's throwing things in the oven, using an Instapot, like doing meal prep or whatever can help make it so that you still hit that convenience bucket, but you don't have to turn to the ultra processed foods. And and I, I think most of the time, those ultra processed foods are based on either low quality grains, mostly wheat and typically non-organic wheat, which is pretty problematic, um, or oftentimes low quality oils are a book oh, yeah. over those, like the low quality seed inflammatory oils and stuff like that. Hey, it's Dr. Ray. I want to quickly pause this episode to thank you so much for listening to this Fit Mother Project podcast. I am just blown away at how amazing this podcast has become, all the powerful stories, all the great expert interviews. And I am so grateful for you for tuning in and being here with everything we're creating here at the Fit Mother Project. And I just wanted to pause to acknowledge you and thank you again for listening. Please keep listening and tuning in to all the great stuff we're doing here at the FMP. Let's get back to today's episode. Let's talk about menopause. I, I want to kind of really zone into that for a few minutes. Like, what do you speak and teach on this particular topic? And um, I mean, the process, you know, the the phenomenal changes that happen like before even full blown menopause. But like, what do you advise women focus on to manage this? And this could be from a lifestyle perspective on certain nutritional changes, certain exercise changes, but it also could be from a medication and pharmaceutical perspective if that's part of the plan that you. You suggest? What I talk about first is we have to go back into our 20s and our 30s and what we used to do and understand that some of the things that we used to do have set us up for the hot flashes, the increase in body fat, and that's yo yo dieting. Every time we yo yoed, even though that you may have got into your skinny jeans one time or you're like, oh, but, but it worked. Well, it worked for a hot minute and then it came back and brought friends. Because every single time that you yo yoed, you lost muscle. You lost your metabolism, is what you did. I know people will say, but, but I thought I lost fat. You may have lost a little bit, but the majority of what you lost was muscle. And every single time that you did that, 
you lost a little more muscle. Now it's perimenopause. And guess what finally caught up with us? The fact that we have, you might be skinny fat or you might be overweight and have more fat than you do muscle tissue. Estrogen goes to fat. It's it, That's what it does. And then it pulls around the abdomen area. So when you're going, oh, I called it Buddha. I was like, what is this? And it, what happens is, is that all of a sudden you have this muffin top that you never had before and can't figure out. We got to do what we didn't do in our 20s and 30s is pick up the weights. And will you get that 16-year-old, 20-year-old body back? You're not going to get that. That that's a, It's a different time, but you can make your body the best it is now. And when you start taking care of that and focusing on health and focusing on strength, your body will adapt and change and get the shape that you are wanting. But you have to realize that if you continue to chase skinny, if you continue to do these programs that will promise a quick fix, lose weight very quickly, you're not only setting yourself up for, I say depression, for feeling like a failure, but you're also setting yourself up for osteoporosis. Yeah. You're also setting yourself up for other disease states that you had no idea that you were setting yourself up for because you thought you were trying to get healthy because you were equating skinny with healthy. And that's not the case. So whether you want to go on HRT, hormone replacement therapy, that is, I always say that's so individual. I will be honest, I'm on bioidenticals. It was the right thing for me to do um, for my body type. And I talked to my practitioner and we get labs done. What I don't recommend is all these little boutiques that are popping up that are either for diet or for hormones. And they're just saying, oh, we'll get this testosterone pellet or here, let's just give this to you. And they're not taking labs. They're not looking at you individually. And they're just throwing something at you in hopes that it will work. And you're just giving them your money without without them having any basis of what they're doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, not not a decision to make lightly. And it's becoming very popular for everyone just to hop on HRT. And if medically indicated, it can be life-changing. And what what's the route, if you don't mind me asking, if it's too personal, we can just pass because it's part of your, your medical history and stuff like this. What's the route of HRT that you do choose to use? Um, it's bioidentical. So I have it compounded. I have testosterone and, a est- and a, it's an estrogen mix. Um, and then I also progesterone. Yeah, but like uh, yeah. in what form? Is it a pellet, oh, cream, a cream? cream. Okay. So the, the, the testosterone and the estrogen are a cream. The progesterone is a capsule. Yeah. And yeah. you found it to be pretty helpful for you? It is. And like I said, it's something that you have to be monitored with. And what I hate was when, and you can tell me if you do this or not, I don't think you do, but you go to a doctor and they take your lab results and they're like, oh, you're normal. And your normal may not be normal. For sure. And understanding that you need someone who's going to be listening to you and say, but I have these symptoms. You're, you're like your, your TSH, your T3 and T4 might be on the lower end of normal. And maybe that's not good for you. Or your testosterone is normal and you're having these raging issues with, with your ment- mental. And you're like, okay, well, maybe I need to back down on the testosterone. Maybe normal is not good for me. And understand that just because it says normal on a lab result doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that's normal for you. Question is like, what are your thoughts on uh, like the cholesterol lowering medications, the statins and stuff like this that we've prescribed a lot of? Are you pro? Are you con? I think this is a, it's kind of become a relatively fiercely debated topic as nutrition interventions have become more popular, but still statins are probably some of the most prescribed drugs of all time. Well, statins are most prescribed drug because I think it was the American Heart Association that said everybody should be on a statin and should be in the water. I absolutely disagree. The problem, once again, is that everybody's hereditary is different. Some people have a higher cholesterol and that's okay. Some people have a higher HDL, me included. And my cholesterol, total cholesterol is over 200. Mm-hmm. Now, you have a high HDL. I have part you, of that, yeah. a very high HDL, but yeah. my triglycerides are 40. Right. And right. And so I had the full panel done of all the LDL 
and everything to make sure that everything was fine. And it is. But if you go to somebody and they just look at your total cholesterol, they're like, oh, you need to be on a statin. That's that's a problem. We don't, once again, we're not looking at the whole entire picture. Yeah. Now, is somebody has cardiac events, is it possible that a statin is good for them? Yes. Is it a statin great for everybody? Not necessarily. And I'll get a lot of people who come to me and say, my doctor wants to put me on a statin. Well, the thing is when you go through perimenopause and menopause, losing estrogen also causes us to increase our cholesterol a little bit. And a statin may or may not be the best I do know that we see, we think we were seeing increase of Alzheimer's with statins. So there's, there's pluses and minuses and to, to just do that generality. And that's why I hate about when medical medications come out and they do a generality and say, oh, well, this does this percentage wise. Yeah. Not for everybody. It's not for everybody. And we're, you know, we're seeing that with some of the diet medications. Well, this helps with heart disease. This helps with this. But you're not also not telling the whole picture. You're not saying what was the group that was studied? Who are you looking at? Is it men? Because more than likely it's men and they're not looking at women and how yeah. it relates to women. Yeah, and that's phenomenally different, especially around midlife. I mean, those are big, big population differences. Yeah. So good to take into account. All right, are there any like staple supplements or key nutrients that you get in supplemental form that you believe are really good? specifically for women over 40? I um, like my vitamin D. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, we just, we've seen so many things with vitamin D for lately. Sure. And it's unequ- unequivocal. It is, it is, yeah. e- is essential for good health to have and, and good most D3. Of, most of us do not get enough from the sun. Some of us can't even take it from the sun that our body doesn't even convert it to the, to the D3. And it isn't something that you should get. I think you should get tested, but know that... Normal is on a, most labs is over 30. That's usually pretty low. I agree. And we, we, but we also don't know what the extent is, is being really high. So I'm always looking at around 60, 70, 80 is a, is a, is a good yeah. number. And understanding that, hey, I'm okay to take vitamin D. Do, do you need like the, we're, we're America. One's great, tens more. And, and, and you know, do you need the? Do you need to take the Costco ten thousand units? Maybe not. You know, maybe one thousand to five five thousand units a day. But also making sure that you're getting those lab results to see where you are because that's one one of the things. Um, I also like omega threes. Um, I take I take a plant based omega three because we're just not really sure what's going on with the fish industry lately. And it, there's just so many studies going out with omega three, with brain health, with eye sure. health. I, I I notice a difference when I take it, and when I did a test beforehand to see where my omegas were, and they were in the toilet. They were wow. even there, yeah. and so I do notice a difference with omega threes. Those are probably my my favorite supplements, and then I do also take a, a really good probiotic. Yeah, I believe those are full staples. Yeah. I mean, the only like we're we're on that we're on the same wavelength. D, omega-3, probiotic. For convenience, occasionally, I think like a protein powder or clean one can be good for shakes. And then yeah. um, and then we, I like a I like natural anti-inflammatories, like a high quality, like curcumin-based product or turmeric, just because it's got a lot of far-reaching benefits. Yeah. I love cooking with that and just putting that in the oh, vegetables. Oh, lovely. Yeah. All right. What's your thoughts on caffeine, coffee, and stimulants and how that plays into longevity and, and a good life? I love my coffee. I'm just going to tell you that right now. However, uh, I have the gene that I metabolize coffee very quickly, but I can still get the side effects of not being able to sleep. And what we don't realize a lot of times in midlife, we know our quality of sleep goes down. We, we absolutely feel that. Yeah. But sleep is so underrated. For sure. We don't talk about it enough. We don't talk about how do you get sleep? We always talk about, oh, I only got three hours of sleep and wearing that with a badge of honor. Caffeine is a stimulant. Whether you metabolize it fast or not, you're still going to get some of the issues of not being able to sleep at night. If that's all, if all you're doing is getting your fluid from caffeine and energy drinks, that's not good. We need water. We need more fluid than just coming from coffee or Red Bull, which has a bunch of crap in it, but those kind of things. And if you are drinking them for 12 hours straight, no wonder you're not sleeping. And 
backing off, because I won't say go cold turkey because that's just hard, but start trying to think about maybe two o'clock backing off that those caffeinated drinks. I'll hear some, but it helps me speed up my metabolism. Eh, a little bit, not a yes, lot. 10%. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's not it's not a lot. Go pick up some weights for 10 minutes and you'll get the same effect. And if you are trying to figure out what to drink, water. If water's boring, then put some fruit in it or cucumbers. But you need to hydrate because that's another thing that we do is that we don't get enough sleep and we don't hydrate enough. For sure. I completely agree. Um, are you paying attention to light, the influence of light circadian rhythm and impacts on melatonin? Is that a part of your coaching and philosophies at all? I, yes, because I have seasonal affective disorder. Um, and this is the best time that this is where it really rears its ugly head. And I think omega threes do help with that. I think melatonin can help getting outside even when it's like today was a overcast day at 7.30, when the sun's starting to come up, even if you get outside, no matter how cold it is, to set that circadian rhythm, yes, I've noticed a huge difference in sleep. Huge, huge difference. I've also noticed a huge difference about not having coffee first thing in the morning. Your cortisol yeah. levels are already, they're already spiking to get your body up. You don't need to spike it even more with, your, yeah. with caffeine. So if you can wait till about 9, 10 o'clock to have that first cup of coffee with then you're better off and you're probably going to find a deeper, more restful sleep, which is what we really need. Yeah, it's well said and totally true. And there's um, actual straight up research that light in your eyes from that morning sunshine smooths out that cortisol spike in the morning. So it actually it actually lowers it. So you have the nice cortisol response and then it kind of brings it back down. So that seems like a really nice flow to be able to hydrate, get out if you can, get some sunshine, then have your coffee. Like, I like yeah. that. That's really nice. <laughs> what do you do with strength training? I mean, you mentioned like weightlifting is like a primary intervention into menopause. And like, what does it look like for you in terms of like what you do with exercise, but also specifically with weights? So for me, I strength train three to four times a week, 30 minutes. And I actually do it at home. Since COVID, I converted an office into into a workout room and you know it, it's it's dumbbells it's yeah, absolutely for sure possible to do strength training at home you don't have to go to a gym and i always hear yes. that but i don't have a gym membership or there's not a gym or i don't have time to go across town you can do it at home and i get a really good strength workout at home and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of those weights. Yeah. Yes. It's okay. I, I always love, it's like, you know, those little two, three pounds that are pink. They're cute. They're great. Yes. It's a starting point, but don't be afraid to start picking up the five, the tens. And like today when I was lifting, I was picking up 35 and forties. Nice. You will get there and yeah. don't be afraid to, to, to get some muscle and, and to have a, you know, I was pretty happy with this little muscle pump I had today in my yeah. bicep. And, and, and it does feel good. And, and when you're strong and you're like, hey, that's me. I did that. You're pretty proud of that. 100%. And it's it's blood flow, right? I mean, that blood flow is like what makes us look youthful. I mean, the, the, the luscious, plump skin of youth is hydrated and it has good blood flow. And I'm strength training is definitely going to be challenging the circulatory system in a good way that helps with overall circulation and has anti-aging benefits massively. So I love but that. If you think about getting old, most people are sagging, right? You're, you're dehydrated you're, and you're sagging. Dehydrated, <laughs> dehydrated, sagging. Muscle, I was like, pumps you yeah. up. It does. It pumps it does. you up. It keeps things lifted. It's yes. anti-gravity. It is. Anti-gravity in the, all the right places. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about, in, in kind of closing of this, I have a couple of questions. Uh, semaglutide or Ozempic is a is a drug that's gotten a lot of headlines. And I mean, it'd be remiss for me not to ask you with your pharmacist background, like how you feel like um, this specifically, but even just the concept of, you know, new breakthrough weight loss drugs and stuff like this. And even for those who are not familiar, maybe even explain what it is, mechanisms of action and why it's gotten a, a fair amount of press over this last year. So semaglutide is Wagovi or... Um... Ozempic, and then there's also Monjero, which is a difference. It's called a GLP-1, which is glucagon-like peptide 1. It is a hormone that's in our gut naturally. And scientists found this hormone and like, oh, this is really cool. What does it do? It does some great things. It does help with insulin. It does help with keeping you full. And 
it is a pretty big breakthrough when it comes to medication for diabetes. And for diabetics who maybe have tried everything and things aren't working and they're at a crossroads. My issue with these GLP-1s is when it's coming to be a boutique drug for weight loss. And here's, here's the reason. I, I really thought we would not see these lawyer commercials for about five years and we're already seeing them about all the side effects that they're causing. One of the big side effects is how it decreases the gastric motility, meaning that your stomach isn't moving like it should. And it can cause something called gastroparesis, the total shutdown of your GI tract. Problem is it's not reversible. That's not good. If you think about colon cancer, you know, yeah. do we, you know, we want, we, we need our GI tract to move to get rid of the toxins. We need that yeah. fiber to scrub out our intestines. If you have something that's just sitting there, you're going to start increasing your chances of colon cancer. Yes. Not only that, we talked about how the yo-yo dieting, the the really quick weight loss that you're using muscle for the most part, you're not burning fat. Your body needs amino acids. Your body needs energy. Your body needs minerals. Where's it going to get it from? If you're not fueling yourself because you're just not hungry and that's what it does, it totally just like takes away your appetite. Mm -hmm. Your body is going to need it. It's going to take it from the muscle. Your body's going to need it. It's going to take it from the bones. So what we're looking at, and I, five years is what I'm saying, we are maybe see a decrease in cardiovascular events. We may see a decrease in diabetic. We may see a decrease in kidney issues, but we're going to see an increase in something that's called frailty. And yeah. if you think about somebody who's old, who's shuffling, who maybe be pumped over and just looks like they could break, I'm afraid that we're going to see... 30, 40, 50 year olds with this condition. I was talking to a practitioner last week and they said they had a client who came to them who wanted to get off of it because they had lost 30 pounds. And everybody's like, oh, well, sign me up. I want to lose 30 pounds. But she couldn't get off the couch because she had no energy. Wow. But she didn't want to stop the medication because she didn't want to gain the weight back. So I think we're also going to see the psychological dependence on this medication and it's going to cause a lot more issues than it's actually helping. That's a great answer. It makes, you can see why people go for the quick fixes. You can see the problems that it causes. And if you're constantly seeking something outside of your own routine and the sustainable stuff, you're going to be trapped. You get stuck with things, let alone something that can cause nutrient deficiencies are just poor nutrition. And that's ultimately a short-term solution. Yeah. And it's it's malnutrition. And so now you're going to start getting diseases of malnutrition. Yeah. You you just replace one disease with another disease state. Yeah. Right. And I mean, a fed inflammatory state versus a malnutrition fed state. I don't know which one's better or worse. They're both kind of terrible in their own right. I mean, let alone frailty and your organs not functioning properly because they're not getting the right amount of nutrition and you don't have energy and motivation to move like man a disease a deficiency deficiency is typically harder to correct than excess excess can be corrected more quickly so that's yeah that's good to know all right well let's leave our listeners here for this particular episode with maybe like a a message of hope um, or what you see in the future is possible if people start to get this uh this stuff on on point and like you know, what's the promise of, of making these lifestyle changes and in, in, in what you tell people is, is possible? It's just end on a, a good, nice note. I just want to say you have the power. You have the power to change. And it's amazing when you harness that energy. Because when you find balance, and I just think about all the times that you're on a diet or all the times that you're just thinking about food and I can't eat this, and I can't have this. And oh, if I go to this party, I'm not going to enjoy myself. When you don't have those thoughts anymore, because you now understand how food works with you, you are now no longer starving and afraid of binging at in the closet. I mean, I hate to say it, that's a lot, a lot of us did that. That how good is it to feel just that weight lifted up? It's it's. Like I said, the doors open. Everything just feels like you can do anything. Everything's possible. And then when it's like, oh, 
hey, these bags used to be heavy or I'm going on a trip and I can take that, I, I can take my uh, suitcase and putting in the overhead bin without a problem. And you become self-reliant and self-dependent. It, it's, the, it's the greatest gift you can give yourself. Yeah, that's true. It's true empowerment. Yeah. And, and you can create that. And then I think who you become in the process of doing that is just as valuable as the experience of of getting there and feeling the freedom. Because to do that, you're going on this incredible personal development journey of facing the things that have you trapped, of of moving into the the unknown and in 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 experiencing and expressing yourself with greater levels of alignment. And uh and I think that's where this health stuff, at least for me, goes into the deeper aspects of ourselves, our spiritual health, our emotional health, and becomes like a really integrated, beautiful experience. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm sure there's going to be some ladies listening to this who are inspired and like resonate with you and your energy and and maybe would like some help with some of these things. So please tell people where they can find more about you, connect with you, say thanks for the great conversation. And whether it's social media, your websites, let us know how we can connect with you. So I would love to give you a free five-day guide. So sometimes it's like, what did she all say? And it kind of just reiterates what I said. And you can go to www.amykwilson.com and send me a message and just put Fit Mom and I will send you a five-day guide. And also, if you go to my website, www.amykwilson.com, all my socials are there. So you can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever you prefer. Uh, It's all there. And... I hope that this did give you some insight and just energy that you're like, okay, I can do this. I can change. And it's any anything is possible. Just always believe that anything's possible. I love it. Amy, you're a ball of wisdom and positivity. Thank you for being here and sharing with our community. I appreciate you a lot. And uh, this is a really great episode. Thanks for having me.